Good evening, everyone. Time for another member update. This is the NASDAQ 100 chart over the silver chart. And the reason why I'm showing you this is because we're going to be talking about returns on investment, specifically the pension funds, etc., bonds, municipal bonds. And I just wanted to show you what one could project to be a normal return for these markets. And first, let's point out the silver price here. You can see it's dropping down from that uh, spike that we made. We're now at about 18.6. Is this decline over? I can't say for sure that the decline is over. I can say that I'm nowhere near feeling that feeling of needing to pull the trigger. So for me, just as a gut instinct, then I'd probably say, no, it's not over yet. But you can see that's kind of a small blip in the scheme of things. Uh, the big picture, of course, is this area of divergence, uh, definitely the largest divergence since this divergence here, which was the NASDAQ bubble. So the reason why this seems so dramatic on the chart is because of how far the NASDAQ ran and you can see it ran from about 800 all, of, all the way up to nearly 5,000. Uh, that makes the silver run up pale in comparison um, but still uh, the trend is the thing that we're looking at here and the trend is a steady rise starting at this touch point right here and passing right through this touch point there where the divergence occurred. But prior to that time, you can see that these two markets generally tend to return towards that trend line. Now we're going to be talking about future returns and expected returns on uh, specifically pension funds, but on any investment really. And just based on this chart, if we were to project sort of a normal rounding off rise here in the price of silver back to this line, I would project it if it matched what we've had here uh, on the downside in time, then roughly three years. And that's going to be roughly, uh, these are very rough numbers, close to a 50% return over the course of three years. You break that down uh, over the three-year period and, and look at a per-year return, then you're talking about uh, maybe 20% or something like that. 20% per year for three years is going to bring us back up to this line. Now for the NASDAQ, that's going to require not being cut in half, but close to it. Close to being cut in half for the NASDAQ. Maybe to lose a third of its value to return to this line. So based on just on these divergences we see here, one would definitely project that stocks are not a good bet right now and that silver is a very good bet right now, short term and obviously long term as well. So let's get to the first story we want to talk about and that's this Illinois pension plan uh, thing and we've been covering this on a number of updates and probably the biggest shocker in this story is the fact that we have this governor, Bruce Rauner, I think that's how you pronounce it, or Rauner, who is pushing for this assumption of return to not be reduced, which is from 7.5 down to 7, both of which are utterly ridiculous. But uh, let's read the story here, and then I'm going to put it all together. Earlier this week, we reported an daunting predicament facing the dramatically underfunded Illinois Teachers Retirement System, TRS. The state's largest pension fund, which is only 41.5% funded, cut its existing future returns assumption from 7.5% to 7%, which was previously lowered from 8% in 2014, and suffer the wrath of the state's governor, Bruce Rauner, who would be forced to implement even more unpopular tax hikes or keep its existing projected returns and potentially suffer an even greater shortfall and greater taxpayer funding needs over the long run if it was unable to hit its bogey. 
Despite tremendous political pressure on Friday afternoon, the Board of Trustees for Illinois Teachers Retirement System, which serves almost 400,000 teachers, voted to cut the assumed rate of return from 7% return to 7% from 7.5%. Quote, we have to do what we believe is the right thing. Richard Ingram, the pensions executive director, said during the board meeting in Springfield. As a reminder, Illinois fiscal 2017 pension payment to its five retirement systems was estimated at $7.9 billion, up from $7.6 billion in fiscal 2016 and $6.9 billion in fiscal 2015, according to the a March report by a bipartisan legislative commission. The country's fifth largest state's unfunded pension liability stood at $111 billion at the end of fiscal 2015, with TRS accounting for more than 55% of that gap. This is how the Chicago Tribune summarized the pension fund's dilemma. If the board voted for a 7% figure, the state government would be on the hook to make up the difference estimated to cost an extra $400 to $500 million a year an expense that would come due starting in July. The governor and lawmakers would have to find that extra money worsening a state budget that's already in free fall amid a budget impasse that lasted more than a year. Alternatively, if the budget voted for the 7.5% figure, the state would not have to pay all that extra money right away, but if investments failed to hit the benchmark, the shortfall would have been tacked on the pension fund $65 billion debt. Taxpayers would be hit either way. The question was whether it would be in the short term or the long term. Needless to say, fearing a popular revulsion, Governor Bruce Rauner wanted TRS to delay the decision, which was odd position for him to be in, considering Rauner has long criticized state and city government for kicking the can down the road on financial issues and yet that's precisely what he was advocating as he tried to delay the teacher pension decision so that's what's going on there and the two takeaways for me first of all is that we have a board that's voting on a figure to a future estimate of investment returns now does that seem like something that you would want to have a popular vote on? Is, isn't is that a matter of some type of empirical science? I know that economics is not really a hard science, but it doesn't make a lot of sense to think about people who have a vested interest, and I think it's mentioned elsewhere in the article that they actually, to be on that board, they have to be employees uh, of that system. So... To have people on a board voting, and essentially what they're voting for is to raise taxes for their pensions. To have people sitting on a board voting as to what the future returns of investments will be has got to be one of the craziest things I've ever heard of. That's like kids in a math class voting for what the answer is going to be to a particular problem. It's absolute insanity. Now, people are trying to figure out what the governor is doing here. Well, I think what the governor is doing, or what the governor at least should be saying, is that uh, it doesn't matter what you put the projected returns at. They're, they're already way, way too high. And what we need is we need cuts in people's pensions, and we need to increase the amount of their pay that's withheld uh, to continue to fund those pensions. Uh, and definitely, I would personally uh, propose that those two be connected. The, that the more of cuts they resist, then the larger of their current pay you take away and put it towards the pension fund. I would be in favor of a law that states that uh, no matter what happens to the pension funds, taxpayers' liability, no matter what happens to the projected returns on the pension funds, no matter what happens to the uh, payouts, the investments, anything that happens to them, uh, the pay-ins by the employees, it doesn't matter. Taxpayers cannot be impacted because we're getting to the point here now, we're going to see that next with Puerto Rico, which is even a worse situation, that uh, the tax money is being taken away that just does the very essential things that governments do 
And so we're getting to the point where the retirements of government workers are taking away all the taxes. So that, and I covered that before, that we're getting to the point where all taxes are going to entitlements. So that is definitely what I would propose is that no matter what happens, taxes cannot be raised. Uh, if you have to cut their pensions in half, cut them in half. If you have to fire half of them, fire half of them. If you have to cut their pay in half, cut their pay in half, but don't raise taxes. Now we know that's not going to happen. So let's look at Puerto Rico, and then I'm going to try to propose a solution for this thing. One is a whimsical solution, and the other is a very serious solution. So Puerto Rico, we haven't heard much about them lately. Uh, they're still in the situation that they were before, which is this board that has been appointed. And the reason why I'm covering it is because it's one of those things that tends to fall down into the memory hole. We were in a big crisis, and now all of a sudden the crisis is averted, yet they haven't done anything. So let's read some of this. Sprinkled among the sun-kissed tourists of Southwest Airlines Flight 982 sits a handful of families and a few young men and women who are leaving Puerto Rico with no plan to return. The flight is one of dozens depleting the island of most valuable resource, its residents. Puerto Rico's population has been declining for a decade, but that has accelerated and its financial and economic crisis bubbled up from simmer to boil. Its population has fallen 9% over the past decade, a loss that includes 200,000 working age adults, more than the entire population of Salt Lake City. In the past year alone, about 100,000 people have left the Caribbean archipelago, many of them bound for Florida, Texas, and New York. Kathy Beckman, a flight attendant with Southwest, who jets between San Juan and Orlando, has seen the exodus from the U.S. territory at first hand. Quote, very rarely are any of the flights empty. The fiscal collapse of Puerto Rico, which suffers under a debt and unfunded pension burden of more than $110 billion, has prompted one of the largest migratory movements within the U.S. in decades, demographers say. In so many ways, this is the 21st century version of the Okies and the Dust Bowl migrations in the U.S. in the 1930s, says Harley Shaken, chair for Cent Center for Economic for Latin American Studies at the University of California, Berkeley, quote, the difference is these people are crossing an ocean. The brain drain is acute and is having a severe effect on every aspect of Puerto, Puerto Rican life. The island has lost pediatric doctors and the island's only air ambulance service stopped this year. School teachers outside San Juan, the capital, have had to turn off the lights in the rain, a result of outdated and damaged fuse boxes. Puerto Rico has admitted defeat in its battle to stay current on its debts and is preparing for restructuring talks with creditors, but none of the proposals by the U.S. Commonwealth or its lenders, including slashing its debts or an interest rate holiday, are likely to kickstart growth. Advisors of both sides concede that without being able to halt the economic rot, output has been in near constant decline since 2007. They could be back in negotiations within the next decade. And that is before policymakers consider rapidly depleting federal funding for health care and the prospect of the end of a business tax that has provided roughly a fifth of the island's revenue. Now you can see the declining population and the fastest segment that is declining. I think it's in a, there's a chart down here. But the fastest declining segment is, this is uh, Puerto Rico's aging population, the segments that decline the fastest is the young people. And that makes sense because uh, why would young people want to stay in a country that has no future? They wouldn't, especially if they're U.S. citizens and they have the opportunity to just go to the mainland and just go to a state there. And still, if they were on any kind of benefits, they can get the same or better benefits there. So, But if they want to look for jobs, then obviously they're going to be looking for a lot better pool of jobs if they're in the mainland. So back to the story here. The fiscal crisis has its roots in the end of the package of U.S. tax incentives. And we're not going to go into that, but I wanted to talk about the bonds here because it's very interesting. This is what I've talked about for quite some time, that the, the story behind the story for me 
is the bonds because the reason why they're doing what they're doing is because they're interested in continuing to prop up the Ponzi scheme. The biggest fear that the powers that be have is that the Ponzi scheme will collapse. And if it collapses, it's going to take everything. So Puerto, whether it's Puerto Rico or whether it's the Illinois Pension Fund, uh, the whether it's the governor trying to kick the can down the road or whether it's this board trying to kick the can down the road, it's the same story. They're trying to keep this Ponzi scheme from collapsing. But what's fascinating about this is when we start to talk about the bonds, especially the municipal bond market. In July, when the government missed nearly $1 billion of payments, it paid off other lower-rated debts instead of paying general obligation bondholders. U.S. investors fear it could set a dangerous precedent in the municipal bond market as states with large pension obligations face the threat of insolvency. The island has been hit with more than half a dozen lawsuits from bond insurers and hedge funds, including Aurelius Capital Management and Monarch Alternative Capital. These have been served before the expiration of a stay of litigation, which prevents lawsuits against the Commonwealth while Promesa's Oversight Board gets up and running. Despite the defaults, Puerto Rican bonds have been among the best performing in the municipal bond market this year, according to Barclays. Now think about that. This is the type of insane system that we have here. We have a failed state that is in a process of bankruptcy, actually, is what we would have to call it. Uh, and I believe they'll go into liquidation, probably, of many of their state-owned assets. But while this country or this territory is in the process of going through a form of bankruptcy, their bonds are the best performing municipal bonds of the year. The bonds, which have returned 8.7% in 2016, are exempt from federal, state, and local taxes. The tax benefit was, for a time, a boon to municipal bond fund managers across the U.S. who often struggle to find enough of a given state bond to fill a portfolio. So there you go. So here is my answer that I found here. We've absolutely found the answer, 8.7% return. That's a lot better than 7 or 7.5. So I found the answer for the Illinois Pension Fund. What they need to be doing is investing in Puerto Rican municipal bonds. And they can get more than their assumed rate of return. So that's how they're going to save the thing. So you can see just the silliness of this whole thing. It is a gigantic Ponzi scheme. All of these things are going to go bust. There's no question in my mind. And the pension funds have been lucky so far because the Federal Reserve has been pumping up the stock market. That's why Janet Yellen came in and uh, the government came in right here when it looked like stocks were going down to pump them all the way back up because we've had zerp and nerp for, I think it's going on a decade, at least eight years, seven or eight years. We've had virtually no returns for bonds. We've had nearly zero interest rates. So these assumptions that these pension funds have made, the gap has been filled by these overly bloated stock markets and sp specifically the best performers of the NASDAQ companies like Apple, Amazon, Google. Uh, those are the bellwethers of this index. And so the pension funds have propped up their portfolios with those stocks. Now we can see from this chart that those are absolutely going to go down. I mean, yes, they, there could be some type of hyperinflationary printing and, and this can take off one more time. I don't really see how that's possible, but again, anything's possible. But if we get a return to the mean, then that means that the thing they've been relying on to get their returns uh, the ridiculous stated returns of seven or seven and a half or eight percent, that's actually going to start showing them losses. And they're going to have to find other parts of their portfolio that are actually going to have to do twice as good as that to make up for that decline. So, uh, no, they're not going to be able to save themselves with Puerto Rican bonds. Now, here's one way they can save themselves with physical silver. Just think about the numbers that were being thrown about. $500 million as a half a percent adjustment, $111 billion shortfall. 
uh, $62 billion difference in uh, Puerto Rican uh, debt. Uh, look at those numbers and think about some of those dollars coming into silver. Now, obviously, they're not allowed to do that. But imagine if there became some type of panic where they started panicking out of the things that they're in right now and started panicking in to things like physical silver and physical gold, what would happen? Well, we know what would happen. The price would absolutely explode. There's no way all those dollars can fit through uh, that sort of a tiny hole. It would, it would just cause a massive bottleneck and, the, and then the price would explode. So again, the reason why they're doing these machinations, and again, it, I think a lot of this stuff is just kind of intended to extend to the next presidency and then have it all blow up. That would be my guess. But the reason why they're extending and pretending and doing all this ridiculous stuff is because if they let these brush fires, we'll say, on the periphery, if they let these burn, if they let these burn out of control, they will burn the entire system down. Whether it's Illinois, Puerto Rico, or any of the other states, anything else, if these fires uh, are allowed to burn, they'll burn the entire system down. So they're doing everything they can to keep the system going, uh, but I think that at some point, if they do panic and they panic into real assets, that's when we're going to get the real explosion. And we'll talk to you next time.